how much do we love Unity of Dallas? Yeah. Hmm. We, we talk about uh, each Sunday and really every day at Unity of Dallas about ex having the experience of God and not just talking about God, but having the experience of God. And it's days like today that we get to experience that together, which is amazing. So thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Jana, for being here today. Thank you for opening our hearts and being with us. Today, we are going to have an experience uh, with our speaker, and some of you may know him as Coach, Coach Clausen. Some of you may know him as Dad. I see many of your family here today. Thank you for coming, for all the family members. And Coach Clausen may be one label that he has because he was a coach for many, many years, and he was athletic in athletic administration for many, many years, which is awesome because he has also became the coach of coaches. So there's a lot of value to that, but you'll find out today that he's much more than that. And what I have seen from him since I've been here for the last three years is that here's a person that not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk as he's here serving and helping. And if you've never been board president, I say there's a special place in heaven for board presidents. But we got to accomplish a lot together over the past three years. And he also, you may see him not only renovating, help renovate the building, be point person for that, but recently with the storm, he was out there helping us uh, collect all the limbs and putting them into the big, huge dumpster that he rented for us to be able to do that. And that service, that's walking the walk, and that's what it's about. And it's also about being able to shift where you are from this place to this next place with change. So please welcome, warm welcome for Fred Clausen. Honor and a pleasure to be here to be able to share a few thoughts and ideas with you this morning. Uh, and Jana, you're right. When you look out, it's beautiful from this, from this view to see all of your, your faces and see the God that, that is you. I wanted to start out this morning, you know, when I was trying to put this talk together, I was thinking, okay, well, what would be a good way to start? And then I thought back, how many of you remember about three or four months ago when James started the service by doing what I called a cartwheel and he called a round off. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Okay, so my brain starts clicking a little bit and I go, I go to Monica and I say, hey, what do you think? What do you think about me doing a round off followed by a back handspring to start? Well, Monica kind of gives me this blank stare look and then her eyebrow goes up and she says, what do I think? I think you'll be finishing your talk at the hospital in traction. <laughs> she was probably right, so no acrobatics today, but I appreciate that. About 10 years ago this month, I retired. Uh, this is my 10-year anniversary. I retired from the job that I had for 40 years as a, a teacher, a coach, and then as an athletic administrator. Uh, I enjoyed it, never felt like I went to work a day in my life because I was doing things that I felt were impactful on young people and then later on coaches that were going out and impacting young people as well. So I had it all figured out. Retire after 40 years, I'd earned it. I was going to go play golf four or five days a week. You know, go out, play in the morning, eat lunch, come home, take a nap, then get up, watch the news or whatever until I... That lasted about two weeks <laughs> and about three or four dozen golf balls because I'm not the best golfer in the world. I've played with some of y'all here, and I think y'all just go out with me so you'll have somebody you know you can whip up on. <laughs> but So needless to say, after a couple of weeks, I pushed golf aside. I still play once a week. But at the same time, I needed a more purpose-driven life. I needed to be doing something still, even then, that made a difference. Uh, I delivered Meals on Wheels for a while. I did some of those kind of things. I became more engaged in things that were going on here at the church. I needed a shift. Even though I had gone through a lot of different shifts, like many of us have, I needed something different. And it wasn't golf. I had already figured that out. 
fast forward to last fall. I'm driving down 183 because I'm still part-time working as the athletic director for the Dallas County Community College District. I'm going from Irving downtown, and lo and behold, this sign appears. <laughs> yeah, this isn't something I just pulled off the internet. I took this picture of the sign. So it's like, shift happens. And in, in my background as a coach and being raised around here, I was more familiar with a different phrase that sounded a lot like that. <laughs> so I've been, you know, one, one thing about putting this talk together is I have to be very careful to, you know, pronounce things the correct way. But anyway, so I'm, I'm looking at the sign and it says, shift happens. And then it says, protect your foundation from it. And that got me thinking thought a little bit, and then I said, ah, yeah, it's, it's one of those uh, home repair people trying to get people to get them uh, to come out and look at their uh, foundation. Well, lo and behold, one week later, I'm going up the toll road, and I get over there around Spring Creek and uh, Alpha, or one of those, and boom, same sign. I'm going, okay, universe, you got my attention now. So it's like, I've got to do something even more dynamic than I have been doing in order to make up for whatever it is that you're calling me to do. What I knew for sure was that I had to be giving my foundation a checkout. Because our foundation, like the houses, and if you live in Irving or somewhere like that, you know the ground shifts, the doors jam certain times of the year or, or whatever. But you know, long before all that starts happening, underneath that foundation, before you see the stress in the house, the foundation is, always, is already starting to erode. And it's the same way in our life. Before we start feeling the stress of the things in our life, whether it's relationship, whether it's job, whether it's finances, all of those things, before we actually start feeling that and experience it, there's things underlying in that foundation that have started to erode. You know, our principles, our beliefs, and our words and our actions are what make up our foundation. And if you don't have a good solid foundation, then you're not going to be able to build upon that, whether it's spiritually, educationally, or, or whatever way or manner that you're trying to improve yourself. Uh, Jesus even talked about it in the New Testament. He talked about uh, the, the two types of builders, the wise builder and the foolish builder. And you you know the story, if you have any kind of Bible background, that you know, the, the wise builder was going to build on rock, solid rock. The foolish builder was going to build on sand. Then the storms came. The one that built on the rock, their house stood firm. The one on sand washed away. Same way with us as we move forward in our lives and our careers. If we're building on a rock-solid foundation that includes all of our spiritual endeavors, then we have a whole lot better opportunity to survive when the storms come. One of the greatest storms in my life was in around Christmas 1988. I was in a bad place. I knew about Unity, but I'd never been here. It was Christmas Eve, and at that time, Dr. Curtis and Dorothy Curtis were running Unity of Dallas, and so I made my way here for the Christmas Eve service. And I can tell you exactly where I sat. I sat right by that pillar, right in that chair. And there's not a time that I walk in here that I don't notice that, see that, remember that. At that time when they had meditation, Dr. Curtis would walk up one aisle and Dorothy would walk up the other aisle. They'd just quietly move through, maybe lay a hand on someone's shoulder as they walk through in, in their way of being spiritual during the meditation. As it would be that night, as I sat right there, Dorothy came by, touched my shoulder, and in all my pain and all my anguish at that time, I knew that everything was going to be all right. Nothing had changed except the energy and a shift in my consciousness about knowing that I had to have something more and something spiritual. I know you each have those kind of stories, but again, this one touches me. This is why I'm here today and have been here and will continue to be here because my spiritual base and foundation began to really be put together that night thanks to Dorothy. When we start looking at our foundation, one of the things we have to do is we have to see what is it that defines us as a person. 
It's not our job. It doesn't matter if you're doctor, lawyer, chef, surgeon, uh, CPA. Those things are what you do for a living, but they don't define you unless you let them define you. Basically, we all know, and we share this here at Unity a lot of the time, is that we are spiritual beings going through a human experience. So whatever form we happen to appear is we've taken that on and we're trying to work through our spiritual self and into the goodness that we can bring to the world. What are some descriptive terms? If you were asking or hoping that someone would describe you, we were at a memorial service a couple of weeks ago, uh, what kind of descriptive terms would you like for people to say about you? I mean, it's not like, oh, well, he drove a Ferrari. <laughs> oh, you know, he has a great bank account. He has this, he has that. I want somebody to say he was kind, he was generous, he was loving, he was caring, he was giving, he was spiritual. Those are the kind of things that I'm now trying to put and solidify my foundation. Those are the kind of things that will last throughout your lifetime. And those are the things that you can pass on to others because people are watching the way you act, the way you talk, and your actions. And it's important to me, and has been ever since I was coaching and teaching, that I knew young men were, were watching me. When I moved into administration, I knew that coaches were watching me to see what I would do and what I would say and how I would react in certain situations. Do you ever wonder, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? We've all done that. I did it when I was 14. I did it again when I was 25. I did it again when I was 35 and 55. And then when I retired, we're constantly trying to figure out. At some point, we get kind of baffled with the whole world and what's going on, and we sit down and we sink into that chair and we start thinking, what's this all about? What am I really supposed to do? Where am I really supposed to be? And, and how am I supposed to make an impact? And I think we all do that. And I always try to think of what accomplishments that I've had in my life that I'm most proud of. And I can guarantee you, it's not how many football games I won. Because I can tell you from a coach's standpoint, some coaches, there are not enough games that they can win to ever satisfy their hunger for winning. It's just like there's some people that make a lot of money, and no matter how much money they make, it never is enough. They always need more. They always need more. They're hanging their hat on the wrong rack. Because if you're worried about how many games you win, how much money you've got, and you need that, and obviously part of coaching is you want to win, but at the same time, the much deeper thing is what impact are you having on the world? How much are you showing love out to the world? How much are you teaching other people to show love to the world? Those things are more important and most important. Now, in order to answer these questions, sometimes we have to have a reboot because our minds carry a lot of baggage. And the older I got, the more baggage I was trying to drag along with me. So at some point, it'd be nice that we're able to take all of that stockpiles of useless things that are there that we no longer need and no longer service and reboot and have a redo and start over. And that's not always easy. And I've, believe me, limited technology-wise. So my idea of, of something goes wrong and in my smartphone, which sometimes I don't think is real smart, along with my smart TV, and then I for sure know I'm not smart enough to help redo any of the problems that it might have. So my, my deal is I'm going to try one thing. I'm going to try turning it off and turning it back on and rebooting it. And then my go-to second option, last resort, is to find a 14-year-old. Because <laughs> they can fix it, I promise you. Here's my phone, what's wrong with it? Oh, yeah, da-da-da-da-da. And they've got it squared up and going. But one thing that we need to remember, that when we do reboot, when we do decide and make a concentrated effort to kind of push all of that aside and to do whatever it's going to take to get us back on the correct and moving forward spiritual path, it's going to mean change. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you just really love change? Yeah, there's four of you. Change is hard. 
And it's not what we think is going to be very comfortable because we get into those things called our comfort zones. And we are very comfortable with the status quo. Change tends to make us nervous. And above all, change is hard. You know, it's scientifically proven that change requires more energy, obviously more work, more concentration and focus. It's just harder to change. Several times in my career, I was hired to come in as an agent of change to either write a football program or write an athletic department and get it going in the right direction. I went in. There were problems. There were issues. I started dealing with them. It was odd that the people that had hired me and brought me in as an agent of change were the very ones that were the hardest to convince to change <laughs> because the mantra was, we've, all, we've always done it this way here. You come up with, here's what we need to do. We've always done it this way here. Here's what we need to do. We've always done it. Didn't mean it worked. Didn't mean it was successful. Obviously, it wasn't. They hired me to come in to change it, but then they wouldn't support you in change. And that's kind of what we've heard all our life is, you know, that's insanity. Doing the same thing over and over and expect it to end different. It's not going to unless you change. And it's not comfortable to change. But we have to do that. Change is natural. The seasons change. The flowers change. You know, we grow. Change is inevitable. No matter whether we like it or not, change is going to come in some fashion or form. Whether it's physically, mentally, socially, whatever, it's going to change. The world is changing. We see that every day. So it, it's inevitable. And then change is necessary. Nothing ever will evolve or grow unless there's some change involved. We're either doing one or two things. We're either growing or dying. There's no just standing there. Sometimes we overthink the situation. Sometimes we overwhelm ourselves with change, the thoughts of change. You don't have to do it all in one big bite. Sometimes nowadays people think, oh, I've got to do it all and I've got to do it now. I want to be making $150,000 a year like my dad did 40 years after he was starting and I'm the first year coach out there today. You know the stories. I'm pretty guilty of it. If you follow me on Facebook, I'm the one that has spring in my backyard for about two hours because I'm not going to go buy little bitty plants. I'm not patient enough to watch them grow. I'm going to spend the money and I'm going to go have instant yard. Okay. <laughs> And then I'm going to sit back, take pictures of it, and have a mint julep or something and enjoy it. <laughs> but what we tend to do is we tend to overwhelm ourselves. If you need to lose 50 pounds, you don't have to lose all 50 in the first week. And in fact, all these fad diets out there say, oh, lose 15 pounds in the first 10 days. If you are on one of those, it's not going to last. You're not going to lose. And if you do, whatever you had to do to lose 15 pounds in two weeks, you're never going to be able to sustain it. So you might as well take this approach. If I lost one pound a week by doing just a few more exercises or getting out and walking, and I ate a little bit less, I could lose one pound a week. And if I did that for a year, that's 52 pounds. But you've got a plan, and you're putting it into action. I said, I've lost about four of me over the years because <laughs> I'm one of those yo-yo people. You know, I'll, I'll exercise, and I'll lose the weight, and then I'll, I'll go along a little bit, and then all of a sudden... Something comes up and I quit exercising, or something comes up and it's the holidays. And, you know, so I'm not going to diet during the holidays. So I gain weight. Anyway, I move on in, in that situation. I'm not very consistent, but if we just do little things, if we want a college degree, you got to register and take the first class. You know, we get overwhelmed sometimes by thinking, oh my God, it's going to be 125 hours I've got to take. I'll never be able to do it. Well, you're surely not going to be able to do it if you don't register and take the first class. <laughs> I mean, those are the things. we gotta, we got to get started. And you also have to find your tribe or your support group. One of the things I did last time I was on a diet, hey, I posted it on Facebook. If you follow me on Facebook, on Monday morning it was there for the good or for the bad. But I used that as my accountability group. I come to this church because there's a great support group. There's a great group of people that are willing to support me in my spiritual path. They're not going to force me on any path. They're not going to suggest that their path is better. They're just going to help me on the path that I'm trying to travel. When we do, 
when Schiff dictates that we're going to have to change things, decisions have to be made. We have to determine a direction. Making decisions seems to be a really hard thing for a lot of people. One of the greatest things that I think we can teach ourselves and young people today is to make decisions. We sit, we procrastinate, we don't do anything for the longest amount of time, and then by that time, it's passed us by. Like Lee Iacocca up there says, you can't decide to take the train once it's left the station. Even a right decision made too late is wrong. So you've got to step out there and be able to make decisions. I learned to do that calling plays as a football coach. You know why? Because there's a big clock up there that has 40 seconds on it. And from the time one play ends to the time the next one, the ball has to be snapped, is 40 seconds. And within that time, I have to make a decision, or any coach has to make a decision, get the next play out there. Now, when applied to my personal life, Decision making sometimes at our home centers around where are we going to go eat tonight? <laughs> now I know if you've ever had that experience, and I know none of you men have ever had this experience, but I'll get Monica, we'll get, where do you want to go eat? And I'll ask her, where do you want to go eat? She says, I don't care, anywhere. You pick. And so I'll, I'll say, okay, let's go to XYZ. And she goes, uh-uh. They don't have anything I like to eat there. So I go, hmm, Okay. So I reach into my back of my mind and I say, okay, well, what about this place? How about that? All I get is the shake of the head. <laughs> no, no. So finally, after we go through this exchange two or three times, I finally resort to my coaching skills and I say, 40 seconds, call the play. <laughs> Which doesn't bode real well with her. But we do finally end up somewhere. But again, it's, it's, and I know that's kind of a, a, a very fundamental kind of fun story to tell. But we do. We get locked into those things where we can't make a decision. And, you know, we have to decide to do those things in our life. Uh, we have to chart our own course. You know, sometimes it's our parents, our family, our, our brothers and sisters that are the ones that we would think would be the most support that sometimes pull us down the most. I know some of you probably had that kind of experience. Or it could be just friends, because they don't want to look and see you be successful if they're not willing to put the time to do it. They envy you. Their ego gets in the way. When I grew up in Alabama for 14 years in, on Mobile Bay, we would go crabbing. There'd be a tub of blue crabs. And you know, no matter how many you piled in there, they could get out if they wanted to, but what normally happened is when one tried to escape that tub of mediocrity, others would grab them and pull them back down. And it's a natural, it is a phenomenon. It's called the crab mentality. But it often happens with people in our own lives. They see you or me trying to move ourselves up, trying to be better, trying to be more spiritual, trying to be more loving. And all of a sudden, they can't handle it. They start pulling at us. They start trying to tell you, well, you must think you're big stuff because you're going to go to college. Or you must think this and this and that. You've heard it. You've seen it. And, you know, we have to combat that kind of thing. Because if we don't surround ourselves with like-minded people, then it's going to be harder for us to do it on, on our own. So, what do we need to do? What I need to do and what I've had to do and what I'm continuing to work on is I need to exercise my spiritual muscles. You know, our personality is mind, body, spirit. We spend a lot of time on our mind. We go to school, we read, we do all of those kind of things. We spend, depending on the person and depending on what diet I may be on, working on our bodies to be healthy. And then there's the spiritual part. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about your connection, your oneness with God or whatever you interpret the spirit of love and, uh, and the God spirit in the universe is. And we don't spend much time on that, but if we don't have that, the other is not going to work, and there's going to be some chinks in that armor that are going to sooner or later erode that foundation, and it's going to come up again, and it's going to keep us from fulfilling all that we can be. So we need to give that attention. We need to seek input from people. We need to come to church. We need to come to study groups, if, if whatever helps you. 
Uh, one thing about unity, we don't tell you what you have to do, but we give you all kinds of opportunities of what you can do, and you can pick and choose. You know, we don't tell you what spiritual path you need to be on. We don't say this or that. We just say, we'd love to help you. We're free of judgment, full of love. You saw a sign when you came in, and that's who we truly are. So what do we do to shore up that foundation? About 1889, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore founded the Unity Movement. And it was basically founded on principles that centered around love, health, the practice of prayer, and centered around the teachings of Jesus. God is everywhere and in everything. You know, when I walk out now, I feel the breeze in my face. I feel that differently than I did 20 years ago. When I walk through and see flowers, I recognize those as part of God's world. Something that, you know, 20 years ago, I probably didn't do that. My favorite, I am one with God. And from the Bible, it says, do you not know that you're God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? God dwells within me and you. And the most reassuring thing to me is there is no place that I am that God isn't. I can try really hard to separate myself from God, but he's not going anywhere or she's not going anywhere. Our spirit's not going anywhere. My relationship is a partnership, not a dependency. I want to be partners in creating my spiritual self. I don't want to be having that God is, I'm dependent on God, I say my prayers and I hope for the best, and God, please do this, and God, please do that. Instead of, God, what can we do together? What can I do to make my life better with your help and your inspiration? We also believe that our thoughts create our reality. You know, if you're thinking crummy things, then most likely you're going to manifest crummy things. Uh, I mean, you can beat yourself up or you can cheer yourself on in your own thoughts. And we tend to do that. But our thoughts create that reality. One of our other things that we try to do, and I, for the longest time, I am not at this point, but I'm working towards it, a big meditation person. My wife is. She has tried to teach me. But like all spouses, I don't usually listen to her. <laughs> but every once in a while, I let a few things bleed in, and I start thinking about it. But one of our things is, again, prayer is when you talk to God. Meditation is when you listen to God. Communication is a two-way street. We always get confused. Oh, he's a great communicator. What does he do? Well, he just talks. That's not communicating. That's talking. Communication involves talking, listening. Talking, listening. So when I'm communicating with spirit, I talk through prayer. I listen through meditation. Now, what I do, and I'm working on it, is that I quiet myself and I try to concentrate on being in the present moment. And to do that, I need to move away to where I can have some quiet time. Well, which is one of our, our references, is that, hey, you know, be still and know that I'm God and that take delight because God's going to pitch in and help you out. But I co-create with God. That's what I mentioned earlier. It's not, it's not me sitting there going, oh, God, please do this. Please do this. Oh, I'll tell you what drives me nuts as a coach. Uh, to see a football player or the baseball player that hits a home run and then they're going to point up and they're going to do all of the cross and they're going to do all of this and they're going to, hey, okay, that's all well and good. But, you know, I'm pretty sure that, and I hate to say this because I know James, you're a big Cowboy fan, but God doesn't care if the Cowboys wins or not. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, uh, my favorite philosopher of all times, Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra is not a yoga expert and a meditation person. If you're not aware, if you're young and you don't know who Yogi Berra is or was, Yogi Berra was a Hall of Fame baseball catcher and manager for the New York Yankees in the 50s and 60s. But he's also known for a lot of anecdotal quips that he would throw out there from time to time, which taken independently are pretty hilarious. It's like when you come to the fork in the road, take it. But... A nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. <laughs> and then also, it, was, it ain't over till it's over. But I wanted to look at this one in particular. If the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And when I started thinking about that more and more, I said, you know what? 
when I'm looking for purpose in my life, if the world were perfect, what would be our purpose? We would have no work to do on ourselves or in the world. So in a way, Yogi Berra and all his yogiisms imparted some knowledge to me through that statement that, you know what? I'm going to work like heck to make the world more perfect. I'm going to undergo the shifts that come my way to grow from those. But at the same time, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be in a world where I can, if I choose to, make a meaningful difference. And I think that's what our lives should be about. How can I make a meaningful difference? In closing, if you would, if you just bow with me, I'd like to do a closing prayer and take us into our next segment. I appreciate your attention. So just get comfortable, quiet yourself for just a moment. Father, Mother, God, we thank you for the shifts in our lives that bring us opportunities to reboot our hearts and minds and to grow our spiritual consciousness. We honor your oneness and our oneness with you and pledge to work in harmony with you to co-create a better world, more full of love for all of us. We ask these things in the name of the Christ that dwells within each of us. Amen and namaste.
crying, but you know, they might be. They might be thinking of somebody in his past who still gives you courage. When you think of what they went through, maybe they're thinking of a child who's the greatest kid they know. Thank you. 
Good morning. I am a stranger in your midst. <laughs> Choosing to give my meditation to you all with using the prayer of St. Francis, of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, which you may be familiar with. Uh, it was not written by the man himself, written more closely to our time. For those of you familiar with the Tao Te Ching, we're taught that that middle point is always changing and we're always rebounding from one to the other. In the prayer of St. Francis, in giving we receive, that point is always changing. I invite you to close your eyes. Let's take a deep breath.
pray, Blessed Mother, Father, to the sacred presence within me, which guides us on ever forwards, instinctively, intuitively. We call to that. We call to that inside us. We call to that outside of us. In the maelstrom of life which we've chosen to be in, to alight one another as billions of candles, and through the light in ourselves and the light in another, we know the way in any given moment. As the matrix of love changes and shifts, moves, gives us what we need, we say in this moment, Blessed Mother, Father, make me an instrument, align me, make me available, that I can receive, that I can be your words, your eyes, your breath, your hands for myself and any other that would require for me make me an instrument make me an instrument make me an instrument of your peace if you would bring your attention to your heart now please to your chest breathing from there Letting your body's natural intelligence breathe through you. If you would see in your mind's eye this room filled with the lights of your community, your sisters, your brothers. Bring your attention to your feet now, please. Feel where your feet touch the floor to the earth you walk on, to the earth you choose your direction upon. Let's take a deep breath to the whole body. Another one. And one more. Let's open our eyes.